Hello. Um, this is a little video going over the book Carl Linnaeus, Get Out of the Garden, um, which goes over the classification of animals that we're talking about for science. So um, you can follow along with me as we go through how Carl Linnaeus came up with some of the ideas and categories uh, for different living creatures. Carl Linnae was in the garden. He just wouldn't stay out of it. Carl, get out of the garden. Carl's mother ordered him to stay inside and study. She dreamed that someday he'd become a fine scholar, a lawyer, or best of all, a minister of the big church um, in their parish of Stinbrohult in Sweden. But Carl was bored by schoolwork. He was always sneaking out of the garden. Even when Carl was baby, he loved plants. He was born in the spring of 1707, and when he cried, his parents gave him flowers to calm him. As soon as he learned to walk, Carl toddled outdoors to his father's garden. As he got, old, got older, he pestered his father to tell him the name of every single plant. And the bugs, Carl watched them for hours. Striped ones, fuzzy ones, bugs with huge eyes and lots of legs. What were their names? Carl get out of the garden. His mother begged him to get back to his school books, but Carl was too busy watching caterpillars crawl. Carl loved the garden, but he hated spending long indoors, long hours indoors studying Greek and Latin. Annoyed teachers told Carl's parents their son wasn't smart enough to become a minister. Carl's disappointed father considered apprenticing him to a shoemaker. But one teacher appreciated Carl's love of plants and suggested that the boy become a doctor. In those days, plants were medicine, so Carl could still spend lots of time in the garden. Carl pleaded to go to medical school instead of making shoes. Finally, his parents reluctantly agreed. What you enjoy doing, you will do well, his father had said. Carl's parents couldn't afford to give him much money for his studies. He was always hungry, happy to get even one meal a day. He had to patch his worn out shoes with tree bark or go barefoot. But he studied hard and soon began using his beloved plants to cure people's ailments. There was just one problem. Which plant was which? There's very observable differences in each one of these. They didn't have names for which one was needed. Doctors, gardeners, farmers, everybody, they argued about the names of the plants. Dandelions, which you might see everywhere, were sometimes called blowball, swine's snout, that's like a pig's nose, or yellow daisy, depending on which town you lived in. Some plants had 30 or 40 different names just for one plant. So doctors would use long, complicated Greek or Latin names for plants, but even they couldn't agree completely. Carl used a pretty pink rose to treat dog bites, but was it the right rose? One doctor called it Rosa Silvestris in Inodora Sucanina. Another called it Rosa Silvestris albacum rubor folio glabro. Chaos, Carl cried, barbarian jargon. That's a lot to remember for one plant, that whole name. You can see here, everybody's arguing about what could be the name of this simple dandelion. People were confused about animals too. Was a bat a type of bird? You know, bats fly, was it a bird? It's actually a mammal. Was a whale the same as a fish? Actually, no, it will learn later. A whale is a mammal as well. Now, but scientists argued bit bitterly, and it makes sense. These are confusing classifications. What category is it? Carl decided to organize. He planned to bring order to the chaos and give everything a clear and simple name. But there are millions of organisms. Elephants, mosses, cabbages, butterflies, zebras, cobras, daffodils. It was an enormous job. Could he do it? Remember, organisms, living things, include plants and animals. He wants to have a um, system for all of them. 
Now, Carl Benet was only a youngster fresh out of school, but he wasn't afraid of the challenge. He rolled up his sleeves and he got to work. First, he divided the living world into two kingdoms, the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. Then he broke each kingdom into groups that he called classes. He divided plants into 24 classes based on the structure of their flowers. He gave each plant a name in Latin. Every name had only two parts, short, easy to remember. The rose that healed dog bites became Rosa Canina, which is the dog rose. Canina is Latin for, for dog, or canine. Um, oh, yes, just right here. Carl named plant after plant, but he never ran out of ideas for names. He named plants based on how they smelled, or if they were fuzzy or prickly or smooth. Often he named plants after people he liked. He called a beautiful golden flower, Rudbeckia Hirta, after a favorite teacher, Olaf Rudbeck. Carl named the plants in his garden. He named plants in the woods and the fields. He traveled thousands of miles into Lapland, far in the north of Sweden, to find more plants. He needs names for all of them, not just what's in his backyard. Lapland was a chilly, roadless wilderness. Sometimes Carl waded up to his armpits in icy water. Swarms of midges filled my mouth, nose, and eyes, he wrote. Often, he had nothing to eat but fish and reindeer's milk. Carl braved the cold to collect plants. Crawling on hands and knees, he searched for tiny mosses. Climbing high into trees, he gathered pine cones. He discovered plants no scientist had ever seen before. Carl's favorite was a pink wildflower with twin blossoms and shiny evergreen leaves. The smell of the flowers was as sweet as candy. Later, the little plant was named after him, Linnae borealis, or Linnae of the North. Carl wasn't afraid to take on the animal kingdom. Ostriches, camels, jellyfish, ladybugs, toads, earthworms, and sharks, all the living things that flew or swam or ran or crawled. Carl wanted to choose scientific names for them all. But animals came in so many different shapes and sizes. Could he do it? And where should he start? Truth ought to be confirmed by observation, Carl said. So he went into his laboratory and looked at how animals were put together on the inside. Carl peered into the mouths of bats and saw that they have teeth, not beaks. He touched the skin of bats and learned that they have fur, not feathers. Other scientists thought that bats were birds, but Carl said no. Carl disagreed with scientists who claimed that whales were fish. He decided that whales were mammals because they bear live young and breathe air with lungs, not gills. Whales in the same group with mice? It seemed crazy, but Carl knew they were similar on the inside. So Carl divided the animal kingdom into classes. Class quadrupedia, which means mammals, four legs. Um, class aves, or always, would be the Latin, which is birds. Class piscis, fish. Class amphibia, amphibians and reptiles. Class insecta for insects, class vermis for, worm, vermis, for worms and other miscellaneous invertebrates, which means they don't have a backbone. Then he added another group. Class paradoxa was for animals that were rumored to exist, like unicorns or dragons. Carl realized that they might not be real, but just in case they were, he made room for them. Just as he had done with plants, Carl gave each animal two names. He named honeybees Apis, that's bee, Mellifera, honeybearing. He named dogs Canis, which means dog, Familiaris, familiar. And Carl knew that people are animals too. So he called humans Homo, meaning human, sapiens, meaning wise. There's each of those categories. Was Carl finished? 
Not yet. Ever since he was a toddler, Carl had loved insects, but he had a huge job when it came to organizing class insecta. Ants, moths, aphids, crickets, wasps, and beetles, beetles, beetles. Could he do it? Carl studied tens of thousands of insects to find out what made them alike and what made them different. He divided the insect class into groups called orders. He put all the insects with wings covered with bright, colorful scales in the order Lepido Lepidoptera, um, which is for butterflies and moths. Insects with, ha with hard four wings, he put in the order Coleo um, Coleoptera, beetles, some of these. Still, I need to practice quite a bit as well. He looked at the ants, bees, and wasps at their narrow waists and sharp stingers and put them all together in the order Hymenoptera. Hymenoptera. Carl split each order into families. He then split each family into smaller groups. Each group was called a genus, and each genus was made up of species. So gets more and more specific as things become more similar. We'll go through a lesson about um, how that takes place for animals. Carl eagerly wrote books about his new ideas, but when other scientists read them, they got angry. Famous botanists and zoologists had spent their lives inventing names like, wait for it, Hypophilocarpodendorum, and there's another one, Monolassiocalinominophilorum. They were furious when this young upstart threw out their work. Where are those words, those names that they had come up with? I hope it's not backwards for you. It's backwards for me. Um, and almost everyone agreed that Carl had made an enormous blunder. He had named humans as if they were just an animal. Even worse, he'd lumped them in with mammals like groundhogs and gorillas, cats and chimpanzees. A botanist named Johann Siegsbeck called Carl's work loathsome. He means he hates it. The Pope banned Carl's books and ordered that they be burned. Carl lost his temper. Idiot and fool, he called Siegsbeck. The two men fought bitterly trading insults by mail. But Carl had the last word. He named a fuzzy, bad-smelling weed, Sigsbeckia orientalis, after Sigsbeck. Finally, Carl realized that arguing would do no good. Time is too valuable to be spent in disputes, he wrote. He just went on naming things. Carl became a teacher. Perhaps he remembered how bored he had been in the classroom because he used his garden as a living textbook, filled with thousands of plants. He led exciting, rowdy field trips into the woods and meadows, expeditions with hundreds of students, lasting from morning till night. Carl and his students marched along carrying banners and playing musical instruments. Whenever someone found an unusual plant, Carl would hurry over and get down on his hands and knees to examine it. If the plant was a rare specimen, he would call for the bugles to sound. Sorry, I thought I was skipping a page. Okay, hold with me, just a moment. Okay. As Carl's students grew up, many of them traveled to far off places to study nature. Arabia, India, Russia, China, Australia, Africa, Japan. They voyaged around the globe. And everywhere they went, they taught people about Carl's ideas. They wrote to their beloved teacher about all the new plants and creatures they saw. And Carl realized he wasn't even close to being done with this big job. His students sent him specimens from top, tropical islands, Arctic mountaintops, deserts. On tables and shelves in his study were spread dozens, hundreds, thousands of specimens. Mulberries from Canada, silkworms from China, seashells from India, water lilies from Egypt. He had live animals too a raccoon from North America and a parrot from South America. But could he name them all? Yes, Carl classified and named more than 12,000 species of plants and animals. Now scientists around the world, whether they spoke English or Swedish, Russian or Chinese, could communicate with one another using the same unique name 
for each living thing. Carl had done it. He'd created a new language of science and changed the way people saw the world. Doctors, farmers, gardeners, everyone began to use Carl's clear and simple system. His fame spread. Awards and medals were showered on him. Kings and queens eagerly read his books. In 1757, Carl Linné was knighted by the King of Sweden. King Adolf Frederick dubbed him a Knight of the Order of the Polar Star, the first scientist to be given that great honor. And Carl gave himself a more important sounding Latin name, Carolus Linnaeus. He also designed a coat of arms as a symbol of his nobility. Most people picked fearsome beasts like lions or dragons to decorate their coat of arms. But Carl chose Linnea Borealis, the little sweet smelling twin flower from Lapland. There's his coat of arms. Even after he became a rich and famous man, Carl went on working in the garden. He planted thousands of species from all over the world. Banana trees, wild tulips, water lilies, cacao beet bushes, laurel trees, and his beloved twin flowers. Plants for medicine, plants for food, plants for learning, plants for joy. Monkeys, carrots, and peacocks shared the garden too. Among his plants and animals, Carl said, I live happier than a king. And Carl never did get out of that garden. So that is the father of our classification system um, for animals and plants. And specifically, we're going to be talking about animal classification um, for our first unit in science this year. So we'll talk about um, each of uh, the classes that was listed here and what are some subcategories and um, the differences between those classifications. Um, a lot of these are animals you're familiar with and maybe have already connected which ones are similar to each other, um, but we'll get into the specifics of that in our science class. Um, it was uh, wonderful to uh, be able to tell you about this, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about it in some of our live um, discussion times. And uh, hope you enjoy uh, your science uh, units and uh, activities that you're doing in Bright Thinker. I'll talk to you later. Bye.